All right, here's something every hooper needs to hear. It ain't just about your skill. So your raw ability to handle it, shoot it, finish the ball, etc. All of that is important, of course, but IQ is what really separates players, especially as a point guard. I've seen so many players with crazy skill and they just can't put it together because of their lack of IQ. And on the flip side of that, I've seen players who aren't the most athletic or skilled in the traditional sense of the word, but they understand the game and as a result are killers. They perform well. So if you can get both of these, you're on track to make a lot of money with this game or just enjoy being good at basketball. So in this video, I'll go over five concepts that you gotta understand if you wanna be a high level point guard or player in general. And in terms of developing them, yes, you'll have to study them, but you also have to go try them too, make mistakes and build these up like any other skill in your game. Let's help get you a step ahead of the game. So number one is pace. As a point guard or a ball dominant player in general, controlling the pace of the game is many times on you. So this comes down to knowing when to push and then when to take your foot off the gas, as well as knowing when to push yourself with the dribble versus push up court with a pass to a teammate. So here are a couple things to take into account. First off is monitoring the advantages you have. If you got a player in front of everyone, you got an advantage, push it or dime them. If you got numbers like a three on one or a four on two, usually you'll push it. If you see a teammate running into a nice lane or can foresee them doing this as you're bringing it up the court, it may be worth to get it rolling in transition. Or if you personally have the momentum and kind of a lane to get a paint touch in transition like right here, you have a kick out almost every single time if your teammates run to the perimeter. But if it's a bit more neutral to three on three, you'll probably slow it down a bit and take your time. Now second is psychological momentum. So in other words, if your team is rolling and on a run, you may want to push it a bit more because transition becomes much easier when a team is flowing and playing well. Or if you look at it the other way around, if your team just can't buy a bucket, if you're confident, you actually may want to push it a bit harder just to get an easy bucket in the books. Usually, if you're in the middle, you want to be a bit more conservative with pushing it. Third is monitoring your and your team's fatigue physically and psychologically. If y'all been running up and down and the team is a bit sped up, out of control and tired, pushing in transition without an obvious reason to may just compound that problem. So you'll probably wanna slow it down. And of course, if your team's fresh, you're probably more ready to go. This isn't easy to pick up on. It really comes down to knowing your players, knowing when they're not fresh. Fourth, take into account time, score, and situation. If you're up a bit at the end of a the game, there's no reason to really push it if there's no evident opportunity. But if you're down and time is running out, well, you probably have to push it a bit. Maybe you have a two for one possibility. That's another good chance. But making sure you're tapped into circumstances and what your coach is looking for pace-wise is big. And then number five, it comes down to your style and abilities. If you're a fast electric player in transition like a Faku Compazzo, and you know your team runs well too, well, you may wanna push it a bit even when it's not neutral. If not, again, slow it down a bit. And pushing the pace doesn't necessarily mean going full out pedal to the metal down court. This could be making a quick push and then slowing down to be a bit more composed, like you see SGA do a ton. Because when you're at a slower speed, you can pass more accurately, use your peripheral vision better, and allow teammates to fill in their lanes easily. And slowing down after creating this advantage can also be a really good tool to allow your teammates, especially the slower bigs, to fill in with some momentum and then dumping it off to them with a head of steam. And as we mentioned, this could also be pushing it up court with the pass if that's faster. If there's a player that you trust to be a ball handle in transition or someone who has an easier passing lane to another teammate who's leaked out to space, that pass is gonna move much faster than the ball. So even if you don't get an assist, pushing it up court with the pass is a great option. Then lastly is pace in the half court, like being able to slow down off a ball screen to allow the play to develop. Basketball isn't just about getting somewhere as fast as possible, but rather optimizing the timing to allow play to develop. Like for example, this big man rolling into the help to create this tag, which then opens up this pass. And this brings us right into the next topic, pick and roll reads. Now I got more videos on this, so I'll make this just a quick guide on what to look for in pick and rolls. Now keep in mind that your pick and roll read, so to speak, will change based on who you are. For example, I can tell you that anytime you see this big sitting back in a soft hedge to shoot a three ball, and maybe if you're a knockdown shooter, that is the read, so to speak. But what if you're more efficient using that head of steam to attack them downhill? What if you think you can get a better shot for your big man? Point being, it's different for each person's skill set. And this can even change from game to game or quarter to quarter. If you're on fire from three at one point, well then pulling this three is probably the read. If you're not, or maybe it's early in the shot clock and your coach wants you to work for an easy lay, then it's not. So again, there's no black and white answer here. The solid guide, but understanding that each situation is different is step one to becoming a high IQ point guard. So first off, if you can reject the screen cleanly, 
do it. This is one of the best ways to get into open space and create chaos, period. Once you're coming off the screen, I'm not gonna say there's one best option, but I will say, if you're not at least looking a bit to score, it's gonna be tough to optimize a pick and roll. You're just as much of a threat to anyone else. So if you can get into a shot that's a bread and butter for you, whether it's a pull up three, a midi, a floater, whatever, do it. Then obviously see if you can hit the big rolling. This could be with a pocket pass, putting it into a pocket of space for a jumper, or obviously a pop as well. And of course, those are the basics. Now we get into the good stuff, which is primarily reading the second layer of the defense. The obvious but beautiful thing about ball screens is that they automatically create advantages. So as you come off here, either they're gonna leave this big open, or someone's gonna step over, prevent them from getting a wide open lane, and now somebody else is open. So this pick and roll creates a domino effect in the defense, and as you get more advanced, you start reading this tag defender, which is honestly the most important player to read coming off ball screens the majority of times. So if you're coming to the middle, this defender is likely gonna to have to decide between dropping to stop this roll, or in other words, tagging them, or staying out with them as they raise up. Same idea here when coming off baseline, but it's usually more of a cross court pass for you, which is honestly there way more than you'd expect. And it's a pretty manageable read and pass since this defender typically has to cover a lot of ground to come over and step in. And this is partially why pace and patience so important here, because sometimes this defender takes a bit to make a decision and then get over there. They're reading your eyes, playing in between two. And then after you let that play develop a bit, they'll have to make a decision at some point. And this is a great example play here. This is a set that they're running to make this big choose, either to stay down to help on this rolling big man, or to sprint up to stay with their man popping out. First one, he stays down a bit too long. And then a play later, he adjusts it, and boom, a nice pass to the roll. But imagine if he was going full speed off of this screen. This doesn't develop. Or here, he has kind of a fake open lane here, and instead of bursting into there super fast for a low percentage layup, he slows down to hold off the defender while this defender has to choose between the two. This allows him to patiently make his decision. Beautiful pace. Then the next level here is using fakes and eyes to create these opportunities. If you're coming off and have a shooter in the corner who this defender is kind of playing too tight to, or maybe it's just tough to read, maybe look at the big with wide eyes, make a fake, and then make that hook corner. This is tough, but the best point guards are great with it. And then lastly, sometimes it won't be you getting the assist, but rather getting a hockey assist which we'll dive into a bit deeper. So if you're a real PG, you're not necessarily looking for assists, but rather points for your team. And if you can shift your mindset to start seeing what we call hockey assist ahead of time, that's big. Many times we're not in an ideal position to make a dime to an open teammate, and that's okay. If we can recognize this in a split second and make a pass to somebody who can make a good pass, our team starts getting more easy buckets. It's like that pass to assist in 2K. They got it right, because here's the thing. As a point guard, our job is to put the offense in motion and or create advantages. Many times we create those advantages by simply coming off a pick and roll and getting trapped like Schroeder here, where now it's a four on three situation. But to actually have that advantage come to fruition, we gotta get it out of our hands and let it happen. So if you feel like you've created an advantage but you can't directly score or pass to a bucket, again, that's fine. You've already created the foundation, now just get it out of your hands, relocate and let your team work. You may not get on the stat sheet for it, but you're damn sure helping the team win, and nine times out of 10, the coaches are gonna know. Next is understanding creation lanes, or in other words, lanes on the court that if you attack, certain options will typically open up. So one of these is baseline. Often, if you can get to the baseline, it's behind where most players are traditionally looking or facing, so they almost have to turn from their men many times, which means a lot of cuts open up, and even kickouts back to the three-point line and of course dump offs as those bigs have to step over. And as long as you're safe about not stepping on the line, you actually have more space to pass with since defenders usually aren't on the baseline here to deflect a pass. Next is moving across the court. Not necessarily attacking parallel, but if you find yourself attacking more so towards the opposite sideline or diagonally across the court, few things may open up well. Number one being a 45 cut like this, Other times, the defender will gravitate towards you and the same side kick will be open. And another thing to be mindful of is potentially looking back to the side you came from. Right. Outside to Krejci, his three on the way. Go 
And then finally, he's getting middle. This one doesn't need much explanation, because if you can get all the way into the middle for a paint touch, the entire defense is going to have to collapse, and usually something's open. And also, you don't even need to attack these super hard many times. Yes, go with some speed and attack, but in fact, it's probably even better to have some patience and composure. Like here, Tia Dosic is getting into that middle, but rather than speeding down there, he's taking his time, and this allows him to play with a lot more patience and composure. But of course, keep in mind that to open these up, preferably you are a threat to score here. Being a threat equals more sensitive help defense equals further distances that you'll have help defenders stepping off their man. So think score many times. And also on a different note, before any of this where you're creating an advantage, look for advantages that are already there, like a player with inside position, a momentum advantage like this, or a quick one more pass like this, which if you look for, can help you rack up effortless assists. And actually, honestly, do this before you even get the ball or before you get into a position to attack. You may be doing too much sometimes. And then last one is KYP. And this one most traditionally is used as a code word when somebody drops a good pass or airballs a nice dime and it stands for know your personnel. So usually it's like, bro, KYP, know not to make that pass to that person in a pickup game. But it goes deeper than this. It's about knowing the intricacies of your team and each teammate that makes it. So first off, this is knowing their strengths, where they shoot best, the mismatches they like to attack, the shots they want to get to. And what's crazy is that this is super fluid and constantly changing. A player may want the ball in front of them to stampede it when they're in an attacking mindset, but if they've made their last two threes, they may favor a three ball. So there's a psychology piece to it too monitoring each teammate's mental state and playing into it a bit. And second, it's about knowing their tendencies. Are they gonna roll hard if they have space? If so, then you'll probably lead them like Napier does here. If you know that they like a little mid-range shot here, then maybe you'll drop it to them in space for that. And then lastly, their weaknesses. If you know they can't catch well, don't throw them a hard-ass pass from three feet away. If you know they're not a shooter, don't throw it to them past the line at the end of the shot clock. This stuff takes experience to get down, but it's a quality of every great point guard in history. So hopefully this helped you. Try these out. Again, feel free to make mistakes as you go do these and pick up games and 3x3 and maybe even real games. And we'll continue to build on this. Part two, we'll talk about patterns, pass timing, when to go get a bucket and more. Stay tuned.